I've uh, been noticing something, and uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, sometimes things are supposed to be fairly simple and easy, but um, it ends up getting really complicated. Uh, like I love that uh, on Facebook you can be married, single, or it's complicated. You get those, well, being married is complicated. How do you get to choose between those? What? And uh, so uh, Damien reminds me that uh, in physics there's Occam's razor law, right? We all know Occam's razor, which is the simplest and most obvious solution is probably the right one. But it's usually the one that's arrived at late, you know. And uh, so I've got this car that's almost 30 years old, this Mercedes, and uh, it, I haven't driven it in a couple of years because I don't trust it. And uh, 300,000 miles, I found out this week that the odometer, the odometer had stopped years ago. So it actually has much more than that. I just never noticed it wasn't turning. So uh, uh, about six weeks ago, decided we have to get this thing fixed and it wouldn't start. It was parked up behind the house. And so Dave and Larry Stone offered to come and help me and ended up getting uh, two trucks from AAA came and said they couldn't help. And uh, a battery truck came from AAA and said, your battery's okay, we can't help. And so Dave and Larry came and the neighbor's truck and we got it pulled down onto the main street where then we could try AAA for a fourth time uh, to come and get it. And they took it into the dealership and I told the dealer, uh, it doesn't start, uh, it probably needs a tune-up. <laughs> and they said, we'll look into it. So they looked into it and uh, after a week, the service manager called me and said, Mr. Westfall, our repair person tells me that your car doesn't start. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's why the tow truck brought it in. <laughs> I didn't drive it there because it wouldn't start. It towed it in and left it there for you. As I told you. Okay, well, we're going to get right on. <laughs> didn't hear for another week. And then the third week, they said our service person decided he's going to be taking it home and see if he can try some different things. So he took it home, and then the service person called and said, he thinks that if you take out the spark plugs every night and put them in the oven at 400 degrees, <laughs> then in the morning you can take them out of the oven and put them back in the car and it will start. Dead serious. <laughs> if I had my phone with me, I'd just play that for him. <laughs> And, and I thought, well, I don't know if that's the way to go. <laughs> you know, our oven doesn't work that well either. And, uh, and so I said, well, keep working on it. And he said, well, we have a problem now because it won't start and he can't get it back to the place. I guess we're going to have to have it towed in. What? Yeah, just like me. And now that's three weeks. Uh, at the end of a month, the service manager called and said, we have good news for you. Come on down. You can pick up your car. It's running perfect. I went, whoa. That's what I said. Whoa. That is so good news. I got Eileen to drive me over, drop me off, and uh, and went in and uh, said, okay, uh, everything's perfect. It's all, all running good for you and everything. Um, it'll be um, $1,750. I said, well, that's a bargain because you probably had to do a lot to this. He said, well, actually, what we did was we just gave it a basic tune-up. I went, wait, wait, you gave it a tune-up as I requested, and it was $1,700. He said, well, the tune-up really was only about $750 because this is a Mercedes dealership, and, they, you know, we charge that. So it's $750 for the tune-up. It was 1000 for the time spent trying to find out what to do to it. And you know, as I sat there at, at, at the dealership and I was writing out the check, $1,750, I thought of the church. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know why uh, it came to me. I thought of the church through the years and I thought, is this how it is with folk? 
you know, we come in and we, we need a spiritual tune-up of some kind. And by the time we're done tinkering with you, you know, we've wrecked everything and, uh, and it's taken a lot of time and money and effort and everything. And really, it could have been real simple, right? Um, so it got me thinking. Um, what is the simple truth that God wants to give to us? Without getting complicated, without doing, remember Ruben Goldberg, if you're really old, he, he was a San Francisco journalist who always had cartoons and things about, you take simple things and make them really complicated. And I saw one once, it was the, how to make this new pencil sharpener. I'm not going to tell you about it, but it had to do with a flannel shirt and a kite and a woodpecker. Uh, but uh, I won't go to that. But um, in First Peter, in the Bible, you have towards the very end, uh, Peter has lived his life and he served, and uh, now coming towards the end of his life, and in First Peter 4, he writes this. You know, as long as this page comes out, why don't I just use it? Uh, the end of all things is near. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift they have to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, should do it as if he's speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from this passage, teach us from your word, teach us the simple truth and what you would have us do with that. Keep me from making it too complicated today, Lord. Amen. Um, okay, so I look at this and I go, first of all, because the end is near, the end of all things is near. Because of that, there's some things we've got to focus on, right? Because the end is near, be clear-minded in our focus so that we can pray. Now, I looked at it and I went, well, what, what does that mean that the end is near? And, and it could be a couple of things. It could be, you know, uh, the, the Roman Empire was in disarray. It was, it was crumbling. Uh, Christians were targeted and were under a huge assault. They were being... Uh, annihilated basically uh, and um, fed to the lions and all of that stuff going on the Colosseum and uh, great persecution and in fact in, in this letter that Peter writes throughout it he talks about that I know that you're struggling with, with, with persecution and with pain and with hurt and, and anguish in your life and grief I know that and here's what we do in light of that so when he says the end is near, he may mean literally our world is crashing down around us, the world as we know it. That's what it could mean. It could mean that uh, Jesus is coming back any minute and life as we know it is going to change and, uh, and we need to be ready. And in light of that ending, we need to be clear-minded. We need to get some focus in our life so we can pray. It could be also that Peter's now at the end of his life and his ministry, which we know, and uh, his days are winding down and his strength is ebbing and his influence is, is diminishing and he's coming to the end of his life and his ministry and he's thinking for himself, you know, nobody gets off this planet alive and he's thinking, well, in light of the end, what's most important? What can I tell these people if, if I've got, you know, one more chance to say something? Could be any one of those. 
Then again, Harbor Church, you know, we've, uh, I'm thinking our motto should be, <laughs> maybe we should block this off of the, uh, <laughs> the video thing, but um, our motto should be, um, come to Harbor Church, you might get cancer. <laughs> it's like, what happened in a small little church like this? And, uh, and we've lost so many people. And, uh, and, uh, and I feel like this saying hello and saying goodbye has become a very immediate thing for us, hasn't it? It's a very tangible thing that the people we love, we're saying goodbye to. Um, usually that happens over a long period of time, but with us it's been more condensed of, you know, five or six years of, of saying goodbye. And, uh, and I feel like God's telling us, you know, I've got you now. I've got you now. What am I going to do with you? And so we, we need to be focusing on that. And, um, and so he says, in light of the end being near, whether it's our culture or whether it's the Lord coming back or whether it's our own lives ending, um, we need to be clear-minded. Now, any, any of you here last week? A few of you? Okay, if you're here last week, we were looking at Romans chapter 12, and remember the part where it said uh, that, that our minds, the way we think gets changed? Remember that? To have a renewing of your mind, that it's time to think differently. Uh, because of God's mercy, we think differently, right? That's very similar to what Peter's saying here. This this builds right onto that, that... Um, we, we need to have a, a clear way of thinking. We, we need a, a sober judgment. In fact, in Romans 12, it even says, uh, evaluate yourself with a sober judgment. Those words, right? And, uh, and now they're being echoed here uh, by Peter. And, and, and the point is, it's so easy for us, particularly under stress and particularly in times of pain, to become distracted. Have you ever experienced having an unquiet mind? Where it's like, oh, well, thoughts are coming and this and that, and it's coming at you, and you're trying to handle things and everything. Do you know it is almost impossible to pray with an unquiet mind? I've tried it. You know, I have ADHD my whole life. I've, I've tried journaling because I thought that would help, you know, or getting up early to meet the Lord. I thought that would, I did all these things, you know, I had a prayer list, I had all those things, and I'd lose the tablets. I'd lose the notebooks. I'd lose my pen. I'd lose focus and um and so i understand this that that if you in order to pray we need to have a clear mind and we can't let all the things going on around us divert us and confuse us because that leads to agitation and then that leads to distraction and then that leads to fear and god doesn't want us living in fear and praying in fear he wants us to be clear so we can speak into our hearts and into our minds and into our lives powerfully, personally, at the very time when we uh, might feel like the end is near. Now, so literally it says, be in your right mind, you know, preserve your sanity. Um, so that you can pray. Nobody in the Bible never says to have a clear mind so that you can have a clear mind. It's never a goal in itself. Now, I challenge you, you can go over to Barnes & Noble and uh, Northgate Mall there, and to the self-help area. You will find all kinds of books on organizing your life, getting your time in line, Clearing the clutter of your house or your office. Getting your desk clear. There's a, there's a million books on this. Go on Amazon. There's maybe two million of them. And, and I've read almost all of them. You know, because I keep thinking, this will help. Yeah, this will help. You know what? It has all these tricks and, and things to do to, to get the clutter off your desk. It never says why. Ever. What are we supposed to do when our desk is clear? We sit there with a clear desk. 
That's where they stop. You organize your life so that you will look organized. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> it's never an end in itself. If you're going to sit at your desk, who cares if it's got a pile of crap on it or, or it's clean and tidy? Who, who cares? I remember, I remember, <laughs> we're, we're, we're remembering Steve Hainer, uh, uh, by the way, his uh, service is going to be broadcast next Monday at 11 o'clock at University Press. It's going to be a live feed from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So if you, if you remember Steve, he was our college pastor at U Press and then went to SPU and then was the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and most recently the president of Columbia Seminary. And... Uh, I, I was talking with him one day, and I said, Steve, I'm so jealous of you. I'm so bitter because you are so put together. You've got everything. You look good, and I look like I'm just wandering in and trying to find some coffee before I speak. And, and he said, uh, well, let me tell you what the deal is. You wander in, get a cup of coffee, and get up and speak. Everybody loves it. What I do is I have to come in, and I can't do anything in ministry or work before I have every pencil sharpened and in the drawer lined up parallel. You don't have erasers on one end and tips on it. Everything has to be set, all my paper. I said, I do that for about an hour and a half every day. Do you know what you're doing during that hour and a half? You've already had three appointments meeting with people. I wish I could do that, but I can't. But I was still jealous of him because I thought it'd be good. But the point is, you only have the clear mind and the focus for one reason. So you can pray. So you can pray. So you can be connected with the Lord in a powerful and a personal way and in that conversation. And that changes everything. And then it says, and above all, love Deeply. Love each other deeply. Uh, uh, passionately. The, the word, I mean, I'm not going to write it on the chart, but the word there is uh, ectonis. It's a Greek word, and it's an interesting word because what it actually means literally is that um, it's to pull something taut, like a, a bungee cord. You all know bungee cords? You know, are you bungee jumpers? No. Good. So uh, you'll be back next week then. Okay. So bungee cord, when you pull them, you pull them taut and you can hold them out there. And that's the word, that's the description for this love that we're supposed to have for each other, that we are just leaning into it and it's taut and we're, and we're straining into it. That's the way we're supposed to love each other. Now, how do we love? I don't know you. I'll just talk about me. How do I love? Well, I love kind of whimsically, right? I love kind of randomly. I love, depends on how I'm feeling, depends on what's going on around me, depends on how I was brought up, depends on what somebody said just recently, depends on the last meeting I was in. It all depends, right? Ah, but this is, there's a love each other taught Passionate, straining forward. That's how you love. It doesn't matter how you feel at the minute or what happened or what somebody said or whether or not you feel like it. It's a choice that we do to love each other and to lean towards each other. It's, almost, it's a relentless love. Now, this word's used in other places, too. Uh, another place it's used is, um, here's a verse, uh, maybe you remember this as a kid. Uh, the fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Remember that verse? The fervent prayer of a righteous person will accomplish a lot. The word fervent is ectenis. That's the way we're supposed to pray. Leaning forward, leaning in. Pulled taut. And it accomplishes a lot. So that's how we love. And then it says, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, 
I thought that that meant when you're loving really intentionally and passionately and strongly like this, you overlook a lot of their stuff, right? And isn't that kind of us? Isn't that good of us that we, I'm willing, because I'm a passionate lover, I'm willing to overlook your problems as I love you. Isn't that, really, I should get credit for that? How about a hand to the rev? Yeah, <laughs> not much, <laughs> not much. Okay, so I've thought that my whole life. That if I really love somebody, I should overlook, I should cover over their sins. And then it dawned on me, Westfall, you got it all wrong. It's not their sins that are covered over, it's your own. It's our sin that keeps us hidden away and barriers up and not wanting to lean towards people and not wanting people to bug us and get in our life and see what's really going on. And we want to rather hide out. Give me some personal space. that's the sin that gets covered over so that we can we can love passionately deeply now remember just keeping it simple so um, he said if you're going to love like this if you're going to pray like this you're going to be clear minded you're going to pray you're going to love like this what, what does that look like what does it look like to, to love like this because we don't have very many good models for this, right? He says, here's what it looks like. Offer hospitality to each other without grumbling. <laughs> I love that he adds without grumbling. Because, <laughs> you know, I like being hospitable. But boy, do I like griping about it later. Boy, they didn't even appreciate what I did. <laughs> Can't believe it. <laughs> they're going to come to my house to at least bring a nice gift. You know, because <laughs> really, you know, think of others, you know. And uh, but without grumbling, so offer the hospitality. Um, you don't think this is that's remedial. That's so simple. But think about it. If if you treat strangers like honored guests, and you treat friends like honored guests, there's no difference between the strangers and your friends. Everybody's an honored guest. Everybody's a person with a story to tell. Everybody's a person of value. Nobody gets overlooked. Nobody gets dismissed if we're offering radical hospitality. And I got to tell you, from the moment we started Harbor Church in Karen's house, uh, I thought one thing we can do is be radically hospitable. Let's do it. Let's just try it. I wasn't used to hospitality in church until I went and visited down in Houston, Texas. Um, it was called Grace Presbyterian Church. Big old church, you know, it's high steeple churches. And the pastor was seemed like a nice enough guy. I just met him. And first night, invited us over to his home for dinner. I was like, really? You didn't really know us. Well, you know, come over, you know hang out at the house. And then I happen to mention that a couple of us are looking to play golf. He made some calls, had some private country club open up for us, and I went to pay for it, and they go, oh, no, no, that's all taken care of. And I went, what is this? I've never seen this hospitality, this for strangers, for, you know, and, and so I went back to the church I was pastoring in California and I said, Oh, I've got this idea. Let's do, let's do this radical hospitality here. Let's just make that a part of our church. And, and you know what the response was? Oh, that's just the way they do it in the South. <laughs> We're in the Bay Area. We don't do that. <laughs> No kidding. I mean, literally, that's what I was told. That's what they do down there, yeah. Not for us. You don't have a private guard gate community so that you can have friends and strangers come and visit. You know, <laughs> that's what you have that there so they can't get in. And, uh, and we had a private guard gate over the front of the church, I think, sometimes. Just to make sure nobody got in that we didn't want to have in there happens in subtle ways. But this idea of radical hospitality without grumbling, I don't know if that's physically possible for me. I'm a grumbler, but I gotta try it, it's simple. And then it says what? It, 
Each one should use whatever gift they have. This is just like Romans last week, remember? Each one should use whatever gift they have received to serve others. Faithfully administering God's gift in various forms. If anyone speaks, do it as if you're speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, do it with the strength that God provides. Use your gifts to serve others, to make a difference. Now, I'm looking at this and I go, okay, wait, hold everything. In light of the end is near, what are we supposed to do? It comes down to radical hospitality and serving. Isn't that weird? It makes a direct link in. No flannel shirts, woodpeckers, and kites. You know, it's just real straightforward. This is how God wants us to be with each other, with the people around us, in our community. This is how he wants us to be. Leaning in, loving, but shown in a tangible hospitality. Serving. You know, some people were asking me, and we're kind of, I put on Facebook that we're having this uh, Fat Tuesday party on uh, Tuesday Tuesday night. Obviously, Fat Tuesday is on Tuesday this year. And, uh, and uh, I never always know where it is. But uh, So people are always saying, now tell me the meaning behind this, John. Uh, uh, now, the spiritual, this is the... Um, maybe it's tied to Lenten season and uh, it's part of our church calendar. Uh, they want something. They want theology of Fat Tuesday. I don't have one other than it's this crazy opportunity for us to hang together. That's it. There's no series of Fat Tuesday sermons to be preached. Um, it's a chance for us to come and eat some kind of a crazy food or not um, and be together and hopefully bring some friends so that we can make new friends too. And it's it's just, maybe it's just hospitality without grumbling. I don't know. We've always made a point to never have this in the church. <laughs> we've had it in home, we've had it in a place we rented down at Greenwood. This year we ran out of places to have it, so we're going to have it in the church. And then, well, we should probably have it down in the fellowship hall, because that's not... No, why don't we have it in here? You know, this room, this this sanctuary was a dance hall originally. You know, that's what it was. Under this carpet is hardwood floors with springs, so you can dance all night and not get shin splints. Okay. If the, and the band, you know, I mean, Paul Revere and the Raiders probably played here along with our worship team, you know. And uh, if that's the case, let's have radical hospitality in here, right? Yeah. Two of you think that's right. Okay, well, I'm get the rest of you. <laughs> the rest of you are thinking about it. I don't know. Hmm. There's a hole in the ceiling where the mirror ball used to hang and turn when they hit it with spotlights. The church wasn't able to take that out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm starting to rant now. Well, you leave preaching behind and start ranting. You know? <laughs> but, but the point is, we've got to find places in our life and say, Lord, clear-minded, focused, because it matters, show me how to love like this. Tangibly. And it may be very, very simple things. It's not rocket surgery, you know. It's very simple. That was a joke. That was... <laughs> Let it go. Let it go, John. Let it go. Will we do it? Your homework last week was to write down two things. One, what does the Lord want to do in you this year? Second one, what does the Lord want to do through you this year? I'd, I'd like for you to take your papers and pass them to the person behind you. <laughs> Keeps, we're going to grade them. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing you now. I'm just tweaking it now. <laughs> that's, a, that's light grumbling, the difference is that <laughs> to tweak it. But I think we still have that assignment to do. What does it look like for us to love 
in a leaning in taut way. I think it's way simple. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know we make things complicated. I know we make it seem harder than it is. But Lord, you never do. So give us the courage to live our lives simply the way you intend it to be. And we'll give you the glory. Amen.